Thank you all for coming. I want to give a big shout out to the uh, uh, free Tom supporters and Tommy Robinson in general who really uh, got this kicked off, who made this possible on such short notice. Obviously, free speech in New Zealand is under threat right now. Uh, you're here because uh, Lauren Southern and Stephen Mullen who were, uh, had their event pulled out uh, by the mayor, Phil Goff. Yeah, exactly. We had, uh, and I'll, I'll highlight some of these organisations. We had the uh, Federation of Islamic Associates in New Zealand who said she was, they were afraid that Lawrence was going to insult them and that they should be banned because insulting them was, was not free speech. Well, I've, had, I've dealt with a lot of insults and insults are absolutely part of free speech. And we've also had other groups that... The microphone's cutting out. I'll cut yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, and of course, the ironically named peace action as well. Threatened violence uh, against the uh, Space Center, against uh, Lauren Southern, against Stephen Molyneux, and against everyone who would attend their event. Uh, thank you for coming again. Um, and uh, it's good to have such a great turnout. Uh, obviously, Phil Goff is the one who, who pulled that rug. And he wants to ban everyone who disagrees with him. Uh, people's uh, views that he deems to be divisive uh, from using uh, council venues and uh, those are uh, ratepayer venues that we all pay for and uh, we've always had equal access to those venues uh, for everyone who, who uh, has opinions across the political spectrum and as long as we're not breaking the law everyone should be allowed to use those venues without threats of violence and without a dictatorial mayor pulling the rug out from under, uh, from under them just a few weeks before their event. Yeah. Um, uh, I've also got some good news uh, around the uh, court action as well that's underway against the Auckland Council. Uh, one of our speakers today was going to be Jordan Williams from the uh, Free Speech Coalition. Um, and the bad news is that he can't be here to give a speech today, but the good news is he's working on the court case right now in Wellington. Uh, they've got a team of, uh, I believe, five lawyers at the moment working to uh, get that action uh, taken up to the judicial review against the Auckland Council uh, pushed through mm -hmm. and we want to get access to all venues restored for everyone. Yeah. And uh, I've got some good news around Lauren Southern as well, not the best news yet, but she is obviously in Australia right now, so the Australian tour is going ahead. Lauren Southern is in Australia. Um, and she will be able to come to New Zealand. The issue is just around trying to find a venue now at such short notice it's big enough. Uh, and the event organisers are working on it, so I can't tell you, I can't give any promises around being back on, but that is still the plan, is to make sure that in the end, Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux can speak in New Zealand. That's still the intention, uh, but, but sadly still we can't make any promises because of, uh, of what the Auckland Council has done. Uh, so, um, with that, I will pass you. Uh, I will pass the microphone on to the first of our speakers, which uh, who is uh, Ali Yetikile, uh, uh, the New Conservative Party deputy leader, and he has given very strong support uh, for free speech. And uh, uh, give a round of applause. And very... Thank you. Nelson Mandela, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, Benazar Bhutto, wonderful people who spoke free speech out, wonderful people who were persecuted for their speaking ability, and people who were shouted down and attacked and in some cases killed for engaging for free speech. This is the very nature of free speech and one of the wonderful things that we have about free speech is first we must define it in order to value it in order to value it we must define it and i would say this how do we define free speech 
Do we define it as a transaction, a transactional right? You could argue that that is the case. My grandfathers, your grandfathers, your people fought in a war to defend against the conformity of ideology. We fought here, here. a war against being forced to accept the belief that is not freedom. Then we must step up and defend what our grandparents, our parents defended. Their legacy must be protected for the future of our grandchildren, for that freedom. Is it a set of laws that exists? You could make an argument for those sets of laws also. But we have seen such an amount of changing of laws in order to suit those who wish to force us to accept ideologies. The Charities Commission have shut down the charitable status of Family First and Greenpeace. And even if we do not agree with them, they used to be able to access wonderful opportunities to engage in free speech. The government has now tried to shaven it down. We also have in our city, Phil Goff, who is engaging in a fascist ideology of telling you who you are allowed to hear from, who is allowed to speak. And Frederick Douglass, the great slave who escaped and became a great intellectual orator, said shutting down free speech hurts both the speaker and the hearer. that we are a people of freedom and fairness and we must stand together because the freedom that we have to speak was paid for by our brothers and sisters, our parents, our grandparents who fought in a great war. Who fought. I say to Phil Goff, don't you dare tell me what I am allowed to hear, what I am allowed to think. I'll make my own decisions. Yes, We are not your serfs. We do not follow you. You are our employee. Those are our venues. We all pay rent. Thank you. I would also say that from the youngest New Zealander to the oldest New Zealand centenarian, we know what free speech is because we have had that freedom installed and paid for in blood. And so, perhaps the greatest thing is not to define free speech by what we have, but by what we are witnessing is being lost. So, so we will stand for free speech until we die. And that's how it is, and that's how New Zealand is. God bless you, God bless New Zealand. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, speaker here is Stephen Berry from the ACT Party. I've known him for a while. He is a stalwart defender of free speech, of free expression, of free association. And uh, please listen to me. Thank you very much everybody, um, welcome and thank you for coming along. Welcome to our neo-Marxist brothers over the in there. Bring a slide in next time. Now Philip got one thing right about this debate. Just the one thing. It's not a gold award, it's more of a stopped clock situation. He stated that freedom of speech is not an obligation upon others to provide a platform. He's correct about that. But the issue we have here is that these are not private venues. They don't have private owners. They're owned by the council. And it is a direct violation of the Bill of Rights for the council to be discriminating against people on the basis of political opinion and giving these venues out. Thank you. Theatre for its um, annual conferences. We've had Kim.com in the town hall for his horrendous messages in 2014. Uh, these visitors from Canada are nothing compared to that. 
This issue has become an absolute mess because of the incompetence and miscommunication by Auckland Council. Seven minutes before Phil got, before Auckland Live announced the reasons for this, Phil got put out a tweet in which he made very clear his reasons for the ban were the political opinions of these speakers. Then seven minutes later, Auckland Live came out and said uh, this is a health and safety issue. <laughs> The reason it was a health and safety issue is because uh, radical left-wing groups such as the Aurelian named Auckland Peace Action have pledged to use violence against these speakers. They have pledged to harass them and their supporters. They've pledged to blockade entry into the venue. This is actual hate speech. They do not have a clue what genuine free speech is. Right. This is what free speech is. You can't say absolutely anything you want without consequences. We all understand that. You can't defame or slander people, that's a civil issue. You can't threaten people's liberties. You can't incite riots, you can't incite violence, you can't incite suicide. Nothing I have seen from these two Canadian speakers comes even close to that sort of situation. Free speech. The reason we have free speech. Sorry. The reason we have free speech is not so we can just talk about the weather. The reason we have free speech is so we can say very controversial things, such as advocating legalised dying, advocating the legalisation of cannabis, advocating for homeopathy, and even opposing vaccination. In 1986, one of the very controversial messages was that homosexuality should be legalised. This was so controversial that 850,000 people signed a petition against it. But because of the values of free speech that this country has, homosexuality was legalised in 1986, and without free speech, I would not be married to my husband today. Yeah. The battles for equality for LGBT people have been largely won, but the people who have been involved in those battles are addicted to outrage. It gives their lives meaning and that's why we're now debating academic stuff as dozens of genders and gay conversion therapy. But my, the minorities have the most to gain from free speech. The majority of people actually have, uh, you know, are quite comfortable in the status quo and if we don't have free speech we can't make equality for everyone that's currently oppressed. What's the biggest price for free speech? Well, you might be offended. And that is a price that I'm quite willing to pay. And when you're speaking to an audience like this, I could have a debate about why the Kia is the best bird in New Zealand for the Kiwi. So offence is not a reason for reducing free speech. And I tell you what, every time I hear someone say that I shouldn't be able to offend them, I'm offended. So how are you going to deal with that? over the last week about hate speech. I've been engaging with lots of people on this issue. Uh, the trickiest part is actually defining what hate speech is. Uh, the guy on Twitter yesterday who called me a sack of crap was unable to respond as to whether I should call the police for his hateful comments. <laughs> um, I've asked them how they're going to apply this. Is there going to be a list of naughty words which we update in Parliament every year? They told me I was being silly. <laughs> but it is naive to assume that the government you elect, which enacts hate speech laws, is always going to be as benevolent as you are. Elections are held every three years. Governments change. People defining hate will be different. And who is going to define hate? Who is going to enforce it? The very last people you would ever want doing it. Yes, yes, yes. Russia, which has hate speech laws, and those have been applied against LGBT activists and against people trying to help young people who are coming to terms with being gay. Hate speech laws are crushing liberties in Russia. Finally, I just want to say thank you very much for coming out. Free speech is fundamental. It will not be compromised, it will not be negotiated, and when threatened, we will always defend it. Thank you very much. Yes.
speech. And so, thank you very much, Donald, for your help and good luck. You're welcome, Bradley. <coughs> Righto, as uh, Dolly says, Mackenzie is my name. I'm the five, fifth generation New Zealander. My ancestors built roads, they built railways, they built bridges, they built houses, they even built a church, they built ships, and they built farms, they built New Zealand. They went to war. They went to war and some of them never came back. I want to talk about the Islamization of New Zealand and why free speech is so important. Remember Tommy Robinson is locked up today because the United Kingdom has laws that curb free speech and so jail for Tommy and any other Briton who speaks the truth. Yes, in Britain you can even be hauled into court by quoting Winston Churchill. <laughs> free speech is the cornerstone of democracy. Without free speech, you cannot speak the truth without being verified or worse. Without the truth, sensible decisions can never be made. Without the truth, a country slides down the path of tyranny. We're in the middle of a war and we better believe it. Traitorous behaviour. Let us look at those organisations whose behaviour borders on treason in the light of the plan that political Islam has for us. Our political parties keep their heads down rather than speaking out on the strife that is happening in Europe and elsewhere, yep. created by the adherence, the adherence of Mohammed. Yep. Why bring in refugees, mainly Muslim, when non-Muslims are an obvious choice? Yep. Our government employs Muslims in its ranks of civil servants and in due course they become people of influence in favour of Islam. Yep. Our council. Look how high the golf jumped when the Islamic Federation barked. The Human Rights Commission in its July 2017 report pushing for more legislation to curb free speech under the guise of, and in their own words, disharmonious speech targeted at the religion and beliefs of ethnic minority communities. Clearly, the ethnic minority mentioned is almost certainly the Muslim community, a community that wishes to see blasphemy laws enacted in our country. Yeah. A community that knows full well the 10-year plan adopted by the Organisation of Islamic Cooperation related to blasphemy laws. The Islamic Federation of New Zealand wants the truth to be curbed and is here using the Human Rights Commission as a tool Simple as that, and traitorous too. Absolutely. Yeah. Our police force seems to be politicised. Nothing is more dangerous to freedom than a politicised police force. Why have a senior police officer who is a Muslim seconded to the Human Rights Commission? How many of you knew that? Why would the police commissioner go to Parliament to push for more laws that would curb free speech? Thankfully, the parliamentarians, the parliamentarians turned him down. Why have a diversity dinner to mark the end of Ramadan as the police in Monaco are easily put on for mostly Muslim attendees? To add insult to injury, the taxpayer paid for that. I look forward to an even-handed approach by the Commissioner of Police in Monaco. Leg roping free speech is all very well but history shows that curbing it ends sooner or later in bloodshed. Then we have the business community that can foolishly help promote Islam by submitting to the halal tax. Business needs to be aware that by registering their product as halal and paying monies for the so-called privilege they are fostering in this country soft jihad. That is, further promoting Islam and its adherents. In Australia, Halal funds have been found to promote terrorist organisations overseas. Unfortunately, as an example, the dairy company Fonterra registered its oldest and best known brand product, namely Anchor, as Halal. Check out what they have done to the Anchor on the milk container and you'll see what I mean. Education. 
I believe the answer to maintaining free speech is do what we can to encourage our politicians, both central and local, local to encourage our police and security organisations, church leaders, those involved in education at any level, and opinion shapers and ordinary New Zealanders as will take the trouble to do a basic study of Islam. Take a little bit of time to know about the life of Muhammad, to know about the offensive verses in the Quran, to know what the organisation of Islamic cooperation is, is and its 10 year plan for Westerners in regard to free speech. To know what the worldwide Muslim Brotherhood intends for us all, the Sharia, Sharia. The Sharia is all written down in a book called The Reliance of the Traveller. It's 200 pages, and that's the law they want to impose on us. Islam is a political ideology and intends to subjugate us all. To have opinions without knowledge is to fail. Knowledge coupled with action is to win. I'll leave you all with the regimental sergeant major's principles of war. Fight them as hard as you can. Fight them as often as you can. And fight them for as long as you can. Thank you, Patriots, all, and I thank you for the coalition for support free speech. Patriots, all. week that uh, a woman in Iran for dancing in the streets and for taking off her hijab, she's spending 20 years in prison. Uh, we think we have it hard here at the moment, but it can get a whole lot worse. Um, right, um, we've got one more speaker for you, uh, Chris Newman. Again, thank you very much for your help as well. And uh, I believe he's gonna he's gonna give a, a big shout out to Phil Goff. <laughs> Hi everybody, I can see a lot of Patriot genes around me. Patriot genetics is inherent within the Kiwis. I obviously, we have Anzac Day, which celebrates and recognises those Patriot genes. On Anzac Day, we remember, not just lest we forget them, but lest we forget what they wanted us to become. And when I bring that topic, I remember the statue of Mayor Robbie just standing feet away from us here. Mayor Robbery, those of you who might recall, stood for an open-minded approach to civic life. He was no closet Marxist. He was no hater of Kiwis. He was a lover of our Kiwi way of life. And unfortunately for our current mayor, the example of that bronze statue of Mayor Robbie shows up the treachery behind this attempt to shut us down. But uh, this mayor is in very good company. There are people here among us. How many go to the uni up on the hill? Anybody going to the uni? Are you free up on that university on that hill to express your mind as a Kiwi in New Zealand? No way. What's happened? The attack on the mind and the heart of the people has got into the schools, down to frightening the school kids and all the way back up to the university where people are learning, young people learning to have their first ideas and to explore, and that is being shut down the same way that Mayor attempted to shut down Molyneux and Southern having an event for two hours, people. Just two hours. What would two Canadians be able to do to your mind, sir, in two hours? Would they turn it to jelly and make you a half hater of everything? I doubt that very much. We've had a chat before and you're very open-minded. So there's no risk to us for two hours with two Canadians in a, in a, in a uh, city hall, is there? In, a, in a, a venue in the Bruce Mason Centre. That's the risk up at the university of people thinking other than the leftist, socialist, destructive agenda. That's the very thing that Tommy Robinson was standing on those court, court uh, steps bringing to people's attention. What is going on in front of us? How can we educate ourselves about our society? 
rape gangs in Britain destroying the lives of thousands of young women. That ties in with all of our social science. We know this kind of activity destroys the future generation. But if the future generation at the university is having their minds done in the same way, what chance is it for our nation? So, we're, you're doomed. <laughs> we're going to fight. We're going to organise. Lieutenant Colonel McKenzie has got very good instincts because he said to me once, he said, you know, Chris, in a foxhole, nobody can be an atheist. He's confronted the hard edge of it, and that's what it comes down to. Too much decadence, too much luxury, too much ease. And the Mayor has done us a good service because he's opened up the scab, lifted the scab off this underlying sickness, this disease of people going along with things that are wrong. Sending our young people to university and not knowing what's happening up there because the, some of them are with public office. And we have to come to terms with this. Even in the elementary schools, the same influence. So um, the point on Islam is very interesting. And the fact that we have a speaker and, uh, uh, from the Islamic side who went to Mr. Goff and spoke entirely uh, about how he had been to the Minister for Ethnic, Ethnic Communities, the Human Rights Commission, and these other groups, uh, and the government. Why did he do so? Because of his hurt feelings. He imagined he was going to have hurt feelings. Now we know that Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux have something to say about Islam, but they're not out there attacking Muslims. They are attacking an ideology, a political theology and a whole approach. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, and so um, the, the, the mayor doesn't understand that under Islam there is no freedom of speech and that's why they're afraid because they cannot join our society. Unfortunately Muslims coming here are allowed to integrate but not, sorry I get these two words mixed up, allowed to assimilate but never to integrate and uh, this is a big problem so being unable to integrate with us means that that whole group 50,000 Mr. This, the Muslim speaker Mr. Arafay said 50,000 of them are unable to enjoy the freedom of speech of our society 50,000 people are forbidden under Islam and yet the mayor is encouraging this also the other strange thing mentioned in the media was the, um, the lady, uh, Val Mouse of the Peace Group, who pleads violence against speakers, Molyneux and uh, Southern. Now that's strange that a pacifist would be preaching violence if you think about it, but go a little deeper and you realise that the roots of their pacifism are involved with the pacifism of communism, which makes us weak against our enemies. That's the idea of pacifism. To make us weak, yeah, the government, you're afraid. I like a t-shirt. It's the government, I'm afraid of. I love my country. Ma'am, that's right. We love this country, but how can we condone when people are throwing acid into the schools in the minds of young people and saying, you're not a, you're, you know, why are you proud of being a Kiwi? Huh? What right have you got? You know, you're from white people or something like that. And it's very cruel because it stops and represses the people, the young ones, from knowing about their, their, their identity and so on. Anyway, Back to Mayor Goff, he talks like a closet Marxist and an atheist, and yet suddenly he says he's concerned about religious strife. Now, I can't figure out how an atheist is worried about religious strife. Obviously, that's what you call crocodile tears. Yeah, right, I think that's what we mean. That's it. It's a doctrine of violence. And the same as the peace movement. The peace movement don't realise that the crocodile wants to eat them. The Marxist and the peace movement uniting with Islam, Islam instructs its members to hate atheists more than Christians. So they haven't figured this out, but they're actually detested by Islam, the peace movement who are atheists and the Marxists are detested by Islam even more than, they dis than Islam. Allah dislikes Christians. And as we know, the Muslims have to love what Allah loves and hate what Allah hates. Figure that out. The mayor obviously cannot understand these things because he's an atheist. So he has a big problem understanding religion, yet he's an expert on it for all of us 
he will tell us what we can't say. I'll, I'll start to wind up now. We're inviting people to attend a series called the Red Pill University, which we want to keep the spirit here going, to build the networks, to work with Dewey and Right Minds and the other community groups that are standing for freedom of speech. And we're going around, Don and I, uh, asking you to sign so we can communicate and invite you to our event. The Red Pill University will be covering the very topics that Stephen Molyneux and Lauren Southern are wanting to bring to us on the big floor. So we think this is an ongoing matter. We uh, know that the mayor and his cronies aren't going away. They spent years digging themselves in, like a sort of a cancer, unfortunately. And so our opportunity is now. Dewey and the other organisers have done a great job waking us up. And I'll hand the mic back to Dewey. And uh, thank you all for your patriot genes and bringing them to the floor. concludes our speeches. I just want to wrap up uh, by thanking uh, all the speakers again. Uh, thank you very much to Elliot from the New Conservatives. Thank you very much to Stephen from ACT. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Don and Chris here as well. Um, and I've had people approach me during this time. I've had journalists come and speak to me. I've had uh, Muslims come speak to me and they say, hey, I'd love to be there. I'd love to be out in public, but it's too dangerous for us. And so thank you all for coming out here, coming out here in public and uh, making, making yourselves seen, making yourselves heard, because we need to speak up for everybody, uh, and especially the people who, who, who can't speak up for themselves because they think it's too dangerous, because they might risk their, their jobs, their livelihoods, they might be risking their very lives by speaking up. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's important to conclude by saying that not everyone agrees with everyone, not everyone agrees with anything necessarily that Tommy says or that Lauren has to say or that Stefan has to say or that I've got to say. Not everyone here agrees with each other. We all disagree and that's why we're here and that's why we are supporting freedom of speech because we need to be free to disagree, we need to be free to have these discussions and we need to be free so that we can all exchange ideas and learn things. And thank you very much again. And that's